You may be seated if you would turn your Bibles to Psalms chapter 22. Psalms chapter 22. Thank you for being here on this Easter Sunday morning. It's great to be in the house of God and in the presence of the Lord. I love that song, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Today I want to preach to you from the cross to the throne. From the cross to the throne. The 22nd Psalm gives a graphic picture of the crucifixion of Christ. It is more vivid than that of John, Matthew, or Mark who witnessed it. The crucifixion scene was written a thousand years before Jesus Christ hung on that cross. I want you to look with me at a portion of that psalm. Jesus is crying from the cross. The prophet sees it. Psalms 22 and 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my wrong? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you hear not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried unto you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lips. They shake their heads, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing that he delighteth in him. This crucifixion scene was written a thousand years before Jesus hung upon that brutal cross. My subject this morning, from the cross to the throne, let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the anointed singing. Thank you for your presence here, for your people that are gathered. Those, Lord, that are coming on in a few moments via Willie Radio, Lord, those watching by Facebook, I just release your anointing, your glory, and your power, resurrection power, to flow out of these cameras and to flow into this sanctuary, into hearts today. We praise you and thank you for the privilege to preach your word. And we thank you, Lord, that it will find its target. Lord, thank you for saving the lost, for delivering people, O oh God, for filling people with your spirit, for the blessed hope that we have in Christ, and the church said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalms 22 opens with the Lord's cry from the cross. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Have you ever felt alone and forsaken? Here is the Son of God on the cross doing a substitutionary work for you and me, and he's crying out, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? Why are thou so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? This is the picture. You can see him hanging there on the cross. He's praying to his father. He's paying no attention to the mob that is around him. His heart is breaking from the awful shame of hanging there naked and from the knowledge that his father has forsaken him. He remembers Israel's history. God heard their cry, and God delivered them, and Jesus utters some very strange words. But thou art holy. What does he mean? He feels forsaken, and he realizes he is being made sin with the sin of the entire human race. Can you hear him as he cries? I am a worm and no man. He has been lifted up on the cross just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And he who knew no sin is being made sin with our sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Luke records that it was about the sixth hour, 12 noon, and darkness came upon the entire land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Matthew said that an earthquake shook the place. Creation was shaken to the very foundation, and creation went into mourning as the creator became man's substitute. The animals lay down in the meadows. The birds went to roost 
at noonday. The sun pulled a drape over its face and said, I can no longer praise him. Oh, my God. If creation can praise him like that. How much more should we who've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb praise him? The Savior was being made sin with our sin. Think about it. So you and I could get rid of the guilt and the shame of sin and what it had done to our lives. And so that you and I could become the very righteousness of God in him. We could be justified, made just as if we had never sinned because of the power of the blood that was flowing out of the Lamb's body that day. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became the Son of Man so that you and I, as sons of men, could become sons of God and we could make heaven our eternal home. Somebody go on and praise him for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Matthew said the veil was torn in two from the top to the bottom. No one at that time knew what it meant, but God had moved out of that Old Testament tabernacle. God had, Jesus Christ, had fulfilled that Old Testament law with the sacrifice of himself. The high priest had finished his ministry with one final sacrifice, and that sacrifice was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God slain, from the foundation of the world. When Jesus said destroy this temple. And I will restore it in three days. They did not understand what he meant. They did not know that the man. Hanging on that cross. Was their shallow. He was their Messiah. He was the one that the prophets had talked about. For, for so long. He was the one that came to redeem them. The Bible says he came unto his own. His own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, which were born not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. You want to know God's will? It's God's will that you be born again. It's God's will that you know the redemptive work that Jesus Christ paid for. It's God's will that you make heaven your eternal home. It's God's will that you have life and have it more abundantly. Somebody go and praise the Lamb of God because we're redeemed by that precious blood. He's the most high God. He's possessed of heaven and earth. And he's a deliverer from every enemy that you would ever face. They did not know that the priesthood would stop functioning before God when they slew him. They did not know that the Mosaic law, which they worshiped, but were never able to keep, that it would stop functioning when they nailed him to the cross. Here's a picture of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ that the prophet Isaiah gives us. All through the Bible, the prophets, they're speaking about his coming. They're speaking about this great salvation. They're speaking about the redemption, the blood of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. He was no afterthought with God. It was God's plan because man was had fallen. God greatest creation man that he loved so much for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life I'm so glad that he came aren't you glad that he came I'm so glad that that nail scarred hand touched me I'm so glad he brought me out of darkness into the marvelous light come on church praise him praise him praise him king of kings lord of lords Hallelujah. Isaiah, listen to these words. He spoke 700 years before this awful occasion. Isaiah 53 and 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Isaiah said it wasn't like that at all. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Look at verse 10. When I read this years ago, it, it almost baffles the mind. Listen to it. Isaiah 53 and 10. Yet it pleased the Lord 
to bruise them. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, church, that we should be called the children of God. It pleased the Father to bruise him. He spared nothing to redeem us. He spared not his own son, but offered him up freely on the cross so you and I could be saved and we could know Jesus and we could make heaven our eternal home. I, I see so many people suffering and people blinded by the God of this world. They don't understand to how much God loves them and they continue in their sin and they continue in sin's pathway. I walked that way for 37 years, but one day I came to the end of myself. I needed a savior. My life had, had turned to misery. My dreams were shattered. My hope was gone. But I remembered God. And I said, God, I know you're real and I know you're there and I need help. And I came to the end of myself. And when I came to the end of myself, I found Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. Because he was looking for me all the time. But I personally experienced him. And I have never been the same. And I promise you, if you don't know this risen Savior, you let one touch from that nail-scarred hand touch your life, you will never be the same. Isaiah 53 and 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When that shall make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquity. Oh, what love. What love. That he took my sin. He took my place. He took your sin. He took your place. He knew that you would die and go to a devil's hell without the shedding of his blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. This thing was not done in a corner. Oh, the world wants to silence the church. The world wants to silence God's people. But Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm not worried about the devil. I've got power and authority over him. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you better be worried about him because he will drag you off in chains of bondage to a devil's hell. And you will never, never, never know any joy, any peace, any pleasure anymore. It is a place of darkness. It is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is real, but you don't have to go there because there's power in the blood and the blood will bring you out. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. How do you know this stuff is true? Well, when he was born, the angelic messenger announced his birth and said they shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. But now, on the cross, he is forsaken of all. The Son of God has been made sin. And he cries with a loud voice, It is finished! And the Bible says he gave up the ghost. He died. Death laid its hands upon Jesus Christ, and he died. They put him in a rock-hued borrowed tomb. And that was a stone placed upon the mouth of that tomb, and it was sealed with the seal of the Roman government. The devil and demons of hell, they thought they had defeated him. And on the first day, I can hear the grave cry down to hell and say, Hell! Do you still have Jesus down there? And Hale Anson said, yes, we've got him. We've got him locked up so tight, there's no way he could ever escape. And on the second day, the grave called down to Hale and said, Hale, do you still have Jesus down there? Hale called back and said, don't worry about it. We've got this thing. There is no way he could ever escape from this awful place. But on the third day... Early in the morning, Jesus stirred himself. The Holy Ghost stormed the gates of hell, went over to where the sun was held in the throes of death. 
breathed into him the eternal spirit and up from the grave he arose hallelujah to the lamb glory to god death laid its hands on mohammed and he's still in the grave death laid its hands upon confucius he's still in the grave Death laid its hand upon Joseph Smith. He's still in the grave. There's no way he could ever escape. Death laid his hands on Jesus Christ, and it was impossible for death to hold him. When God's eternal clock reached a precise moment in time, glory to God, he came out of that grave, glory to God. He came out of that prison of death. You can come out of that prison of death. He arose from the dead in the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose. Glory to God. Glory to God. Christ arose. Come on, let's give him a standing ovation. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Give the devil a migraine headache because you've experienced resurrection power. Glory, 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 glory. Hasha, Hashemor, Shataya. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory, glory. Jesus Christ is alive and he rules and he reigns on high today as Lord and a high priest of a new and a better covenant that he cut with his own precious blood. He is not behind us in the throne. He's not behind us in the tomb. He is before us on a throne. And he is the king of kings. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He is Lord of lords. I want to ask you a question this morning. Suppose that had not happened. Suppose death still had Jesus just like it has all the others. Then what? Suppose there is no resurrection. Suppose there is no hope of eternal life. Well, the Bible asks that very question. The Apostle Paul asked in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. Paul said, Now if Christ be priest and he rose from the dead, hath say some among you, there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified that God raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. There is no hope for anyone except for the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to his lies. Don't let him tell you that everything's going to be okay. No, sin has pleasure for a season. But let me tell you something. The devil will drag you off in the chains of everlasting darkness if you let him. You're in the house of God. You're hearing the word of God preached. The anointing is flowing. The river is here. God's love is here. God's power is here. God's anointing is here. And you can be saved. Go on, praise God, church. Hallelujah. That you are saved. Christ be not raised. Your faith is vain and you are yet in your sins. Verse 18. Then they also which are asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. Oh, but look at this decoration. Hallelujah. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. What does that mean? That means because he rose from the dead, you can be saved. And when you die, you will be raised from the dead by the same power that raised Jesus Christ woo, from the dead. See, I feel it in my feet. I feel it in my arm. I feel it all over me. That's the quickening power of the Holy Ghost. How can a 75-year-old man dance and praise God like that? Hallelujah. Shut up. It's him. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the anointing. He'll give you joy unspeakable that's full of glory. Hallelujah. What a God. What a Savior. The Apostle Paul mentioned an almost unthinkable thing here. And that unthinkable thing is this. Suppose there is 
no Easter. Suppose Christ is still in the grave. Paul said, if there is no empty tomb, there are six tragic things that happened in those scriptures that I just read. Six tragic things, if he did not rise from the dead, that we need to consider. First of all, he says, if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. That word vain means it's empty, it's unprofitable, it's useless, it's just a waste of time. Listen, if there is no resurrection, then we are wasting our time by being here. I am wasting my time by preaching, and you are wasting your time by listening. If there is no resurrection, and if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we ought to all be doing something else. If there is no resurrection, our preaching is vain, it is futile, it is worthless. It is of no profit at all if Christ is still in the grave. The heart of the gospel is this. Paul said, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. How do we know it? He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. There is no preacher who can preach the gospel unless he preaches the resurrection. If a man does not preach the resurrection, he needs to close up his shop and go home. A man who does not preach the resurrection, he needs to get out of the pulpit and get himself another job. If he doesn't believe that Jesus Christ came out of that grave, his preaching is vain, empty, worthless, and useless. But then Paul mentions something else. Look at this. He said, and if Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. Paul said, if Jesus Christ is still in that grave, your faith is useless. Paul said, if Christ is still in that grave, you're trusting something that does not deserve your faith. What are you trusting in today? Uh, are you thinking that you're going to live your life out and, and sometimes when you get older that you got plenty of time and one day I'll bow my head. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. But I'm not going to receive him. Let me tell you something. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Life is like a vapor. Shakespeare said that. But James said life is lot of, like a vapor. It's here one moment and it's gone. Have you ever seen the clouds rise, fog all over the place early in the morning? And then when the sun comes up, it's scorched and it's gone. You don't give your life to Jesus Christ. If you don't make him Lord of your life, let me tell you something. That will be your end. Like a vapor, you'll end up in chains of darkness. Paul said, if Christ is still in that grave, you're trusting something that does not deserve your trust. I mean, who wants to put their trust in Jesus Christ if he is still dead? It's not enough to believe that Jesus died for your sins. If he did not rise from the dead, your faith is vain. It is useless. The Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Aren't you glad that one day you believed in that same power that raised Jesus from the dead flowed into your heart and you were saved? If you don't believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, your faith is foolish. Now, that's the difference between Jesus Christ and other religious leaders. Oh, you know, all those religions are just alike. You know, they all got the same story in there. But let me tell you the big difference. It was God in human flesh hanging on that cross when Jesus Christ died. He was no ordinary man. That was no ordinary blood. That blood has a mysterious quality about it. And that blood, if I get it on this white shirt, this shirt is stained.
but that blood can wash away every stain of sin and cleanse your heart, woo, and make you just as white as the fresh fallen snow. Go on and praise him. You've been washed and cleansed by the blood. <laughs> Glory to God. See, that's the difference between Jesus and others. He rose from the dead. Mohammed is still in the grave. Mohammed is there. Confucius is there in the grave. Joseph Smith is there. Every other religious leader is there. They live, they died, and they are dead. Jesus lived, he died, and he rose again. How, pastor, do you know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God without a doubt? How do I know the Bible is true? Oh, let me tell you. How do I know that the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ? Let me tell you. I'll tell you how I know. He raised Jesus from the dead, and he raised me from spiritual death. And I'm looking at people and preaching to people and preaching through these cameras to people who've been raised from spiritual death by the power of the blood. Glory to God. And when God raised him from the dead, that was God's stamp of approval on all that Jesus taught and said. He was shown to be the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. He said, I have the power to lay my life down. I have the power to take it up again. And then he said, this commandment have I received from my father. Oh, you got to trust him. Do you trust him? Let me tell you about Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me tell you what a savior. Oh, who's this man called Jesus? What manner of man is he? He's the one who can calm your trouble see. He calls blind eyes open. He turned the water into wine. He's the savior, the redeemer, the way for mankind. He's a strong and mighty tower. He's a refuge in life. He's a lily of every valley. He's both the buyer and the price. Hallelujah. My. I was sitting in Sunday school years ago. Wait, that was one of the songs the Lord gave me out of a great struggle. Do you know your great blessings in life? Many times they come out of a great struggle. The bigger the giant, the harder he falls. Hallelujah. And how would you ever know you're an overcomer if you didn't have something to overcome? But I, I, I had been saved. I'm a brand new Christian. I went back and checked the date on this thing. It was the Easter after I got saved. I got saved September 26, 1982. This is Easter. April. We hadn't gone a year yet. Things started happening to me. Strange things. Preaching sermons. Writing songs, writing poetry. And this little song floated up to me. It said, you heard the story of the man from Galilee. How he came and how he died upon the tree. Although they mocked, condemned, and crucified him. He rules and reigns within my heart today. He's risen from the dead. The stone's been rolled away. He's risen from the dead and he reigns on high today. He paid the price for you. He paid the price for me by the shed blood at Mount Calvary. We don't serve a dead Savior. A dead Savior is nobody's Savior. The third thing I want you to see is this. If Christ had not been raised, the disciples were deceived. What time is this service supposed to be over? Hallelujah. I'm... I'm I just love preaching about Jesus. Is it supposed to be 1030? Somewhere in there. First Corinthians 15, 15. Paul said, yay. And we have found false witnesses of God because we've testified that God raised him from the dead. If so be that the dead rise not. Paul is not saying if Christ is still in the grave, we're mistaken. Oh, no, he didn't say that at all. He said, if Christ is not raised, we are found false witnesses. We are all liars. Well, preacher, how do you know they didn't make all this stuff up? Well, I got the word of you. But I'll tell you how I know. Most of these men that witnessed, preached this gospel in the early days, they paid with their own blood for their testimony for their faith in Jesus. They suffered, they bled, they died because they believed in Jesus Christ. 
They suffered, they bled, and they died to bring you the good news that you can be saved. Are you going to tell me that Peter and John and Paul and James and all the others who died a martyr's death, are you going to tell me that there's no resurrection? Common sense would say no. Fourthly, if there's no empty tomb, then sin is sovereign. That's powerful. If there is no empty tomb, sin is sovereign. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Paul be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. What does that mean? That means that if Christ is still in the grave, that God did not accept his death as full payment for your sins. The only positive proof that your sins were paid for by Jesus Christ is the fact that God raised him from the dead. And if Christ be not raised, you are yet in your sin. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no hope. That he died is not important unless he rose again from the dead. No resurrection, no Savior, no Savior, no forgiveness. No forgiveness, no justification, no justification, no cleansing. No cleansing, no hope. Because you are yet in your sins. And if the penalty of sin is still upon you, you are destined for an eternity in hell. A place of darkness. Oh, we're going to have a party when we get to heaven. We're going to break out the slits and we're going to dance. No, you won't be dancing. It will be a place of darkness. A place of weeping, of gnashing. There'll be preachers there and people crying out, why didn't you preach to me about the, 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 the this new birth I could have? Why did you preach to me and you never told me about this awful place called hell? Why? 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 A thousand whys will go out. My Lord, the penalty of sin is still upon you, my friend. You're destined for an eternity in hell. Let me mention one other consequence if there's no empty tomb. If Jesus Christ is still in the grave, death has dominion. Look at verse 18, 1 Corinthians 15, 18. Then they also which are fallen and sleep in Christ are perished. Your mother, your father, your children, your husband, your wives, your loved ones, they are dead and gone forever if Christ be not raised. If Christ be not raised, you will never see your loved ones again. They are in the grave to rot and decay. Are you going to ask me to believe that a God who created this universe, he ends it all by running down to the grave? Am I supposed to believe that? I've got a mind. I can look and I can see. Hallelujah. Am I supposed to believe that I am created in the image of an eternal God and that God created us just to die? Am I supposed to believe that death has dominion? No, I cannot believe that. Even nature itself defies that type of logic. Winter is always followed by springtime. The very seasons of the year tell me there's a resurrection. The heavens declare his glory. The firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day utter its speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no language, no speech, where his voice is not heard. Hallelujah. Notice what Paul says in verse 19. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. He said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. What does that mean? Well, it means if that's all there is, then it's just bad news. The good times are but for a moment. And life is going to get worse and worse. You don't think about that when you're young. But as you get older and you see people all around you dying, you might bury one of your siblings, your mother, 
Oh, you're dead. What heartache if there is no resurrection? What a terrible tragedy if there is no resurrection. One by one, you're going to see your loved ones die. Think about it. What do people have to look forward to who don't know Jesus? No wonder those who don't know Jesus, they drink, they get drunk, and they stay drunk. No wonder they shoot up on drugs, shoot heroin into their arms, and sniff cocaine and crack, trying to escape the reality of life. What do they have to look forward to? A hole in the ground? An eternity in hell? I'm not recommending that you get drunk. I'm recommending that you give your heart to Jesus. Because God sent me. I didn't even choose to do this. I am sent to tell you about a loving God who cares for you. Who would spare nothing to save your life. Some of you got children now. Are you going to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Are you going to give them a chance to hear the gospel? Are you going to keep the good news from them? You know, when daddy gets saved, when mother gets saved, do you know the rest of the church, the family will get saved? They will. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. He said, you were dead in your sin and transgression. You used to live just like the rest of the world. Paul said, that's where God found you. <laughs> That's where he found me living like the rest of the world. Oh, my goodness. Sin has pleasure for a season, but it carried me down, 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 down. And it'll carry you down. Listen to Paul preach. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins and transgression, has he quickened us together with Christ has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. The devil will lie to you. He'll tell you, if you gave your heart to Jesus, you couldn't live it. He told me that all my life. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, that old man died. <laughs> Hallelujah. With his deceitful lust and his sin, I threw that thing aside and put on Christ Jesus. Became a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. All things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus went from the cross to the throne. The writer of Hebrews says, seeing then that we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ has passed into heaven. Let us hold fast our profession. A confession of faith, for we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we, yet without sin. Then he says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Sinner, friend, God is saying you can get up, you can rise, and you can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. Redemption was no afterthought with God. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. And the great hope of Easter is that we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is risen. He is alive. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the Savior. My question to you is this. Do you know him? Do you know him? Have you experienced this great life? Are you saved? The summer is passing. Spiritually speaking. And if you're not saved, the end is coming. Let us stand. Because... He lives. I can face tomorrow because He, he lives. lives. All 
want to be saved today, these altars are open. God brought you here. If you backslidden, God brought you here. I know. He wanted to talk to you one more time. And he laid this upon my heart. And he wants to place his love upon your heart. Brother Ray, come and help sing. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because opens his arms of love to you today. I want you to think back on your life. Some of you have been to the jaws of death. Looked it right in the face. Yet God pulled you out of it. Because he lives. He's a loving Savior. I can face tomorrow. I know the thoughts I have for you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of good. Because Not of evil. Give you a future. Oh, to give you a hope. To give you an expected end. You can know Jesus. And you can know what to expect at the end. He holds the future. I love you, Lord. Thank you so much for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for this great salvation. Thank you, Master. Because he lived, I can face tomorrow. Because he lived, all fear is gone. You're still with us by live stream if you don't know Jesus. Pray this simple prayer if God has spoken to you. Lord, I know I'm lost. I need a Savior. I know I cannot save myself. I believe you shed your blood on that cross as my substitute. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart. Wash my sins away. Cleanse me, God, from all sin. Save me, Lord. I need a Savior. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Thank you, Lord. Come into my heart. I heard you knock. I receive you. Thank you that I'm saved. Hallelujah. Because I you pray that prayer right there and you mean it from your heart. God will save you. You're saved if you believe. And if you confess him, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. How could that happen? Because it's all by faith. And that's the way God designed it. God designed it that way. He never forces himself in. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man hear my voice and will open the door. I will come into him. I'll be his God. I'll be his Savior. There's a picture in London, England, in an art gallery. Jesus is standing outside the door. There's a door handle there, but it's not on the outside. The door handle is on the inside. Won't you open the door? Come make Jesus Lord of your life. Sing it, church. Because he lives. <laughs> I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear, all fear. Not afraid to live, gone. not afraid to die. Hallelujah. Because I know he holds the future. Because he lives. And 
I know. Because I know. Yes, I know. Glory to God. He holds my future. Thank you so much for being here on this Resurrection Sunday. If you want to stay for the second service, it'll be again at 11. But if you've got other things to do, then you're dismissed. And as you're going out, look at three people and tell them, you are blessed and highly favored of God. You are blessed and highly favored of God. Yes, God is a great God.